today we're going to look at how to survive a bear attack. Now, you might think that if you have your bear spray or you have your weapon with you when you're out hunting, camping, fishing, or hiking, that you're going to be protected. But are you really? So today, we're going to take a bunch of different sidearms and shotguns and practice on moving targets and simulate bear charges. On the other end of the spectrum, we're going to test our bear spray and we're going to see if expired bear spray works and hopefully answer all the questions that you might have if you can survive a bear encounter in the backcountry. Hit that bear low, didn't even track him last night, just backed out, got out of there. Now we're about 14 hours later, we're gonna go see if we can trail him up and see if we can't find him. Five hours into the search, I ran across the bear. It saw me and it kind of worked back up into the brush and laid down, so I just worked up the hill and got up underneath that bear to get another arrow into it. I moved really quietly. There's one in the chamber. I just put it in my pocket like this, and I hooked my release on, drew back, and I kind of worked up a little bit more, and I could see just a nice quartering away angle and shot. And as soon as I shot, that bear turned around and kind of like looked behind itself and it had no idea what happened. I just set my bow down right in front of me, pulled out my pistol. The bear like looked up, locked on me and just came full charge. Unbelievable. That's not staged. Straight up. That bear tumbled down the hill and landed on my bow. It was right there. It was seven feet away. And it, its head was down right there and I shot it right in the forehead at five feet. And it died right there. That's where I dropped my bow. I didn't stage any of that. The thing tumbled over and that's how it died. Look at that, right between the eyes at point blank. That's where I shot her at five feet. In the moment, you're nervous, your, your mechanics go out the window, but I got lucky. I hit it right in the forehead, right in the brain. I was using a 45 auto, it's full metal jackets. It speaks for itself, the damage, right through the brain, blew out the side of the skull. Before I go out in the woods or before I go out on any hunt for that matter, whether I'm hunting for deer, elk, or bears, I'm always thinking about readiness. How accessible do I have my bear spray or my pistol to be able to deploy it within seconds? And that's huge, especially in situations where you're surprised and you may only have a few seconds. Who knows how old this thing is? Look at those teeth, they're worn out. I still can't believe that happened. Multiple people are getting attacked every year and close encounters every year. I just can't imagine it not carrying some sort of pistol when you're in the backcountry these days because it just seems like it's getting crazier and crazier. So I don't care whether it's a grizzly bear or a black bear, they're both dangerous. We have my buddy Ben Bishop out here. He is a product trainer for Sig Sauer. He knows his pistols and he has a lot of helpful insight on shooting and so he's going to help me today describing the variety of pistols that we have, what's going to be the best to carry, what caliber is going to be the best for bear protection. Let's start off with the big gun. Everybody thinks of a 44 Magnum as being the powerful bear gun to carry. Definitely has a lot of knockdown power. You get into a dilemma where how much can you actually handle in one hand if you're you know, fighting off a grizzly or say your other arm is disabled and you can't shoot it two-handed. How much more can you handle more than 44 after one shot? You have six shots. That's all you have, so you're kind of limited in that way. Since I usually do a lot of backcountry hunting is, do I want to pack all this weight? This is probably the heaviest pistol that we have here. When I'm packing this much weight, I prefer the shoulder holster, the shoulder harness. These harnesses have to be comfortable for you to want to pack them. This is just a very basic webbing shoulder holster. About ready to go on a hunt. I tend not to grab the 44 because it's not as comfortable and it's just heavier. 
I wanted to lead it, and the third shot, I made myself not lead it, and I hit it right through the cardboard. That's why we're out here practicing. It's like, man, you gotta expose your weaknesses so you can get better. The 1911. Some guys are fans of 1911, some aren't. I like them. As long as I can shoot it really well, that's the type of sidearm I want for bear protection. In this case, I have the, the SIG 1911, and I have the, the VersaCarry shoulder harness. If I'm doing any sort of horseback hunt, I always use a shoulder holster. With your backpack on, riding a horse, this is the spot that it's out of the way to me in a ready position rather than just stuffing it in your backpack because it's not comfortable to carry while riding a horse. Comfort is number one to wanting to carry a pistol and this shoulder harness makes it very easy. Number two, magazine capacity that's over six rounds and specifically the 10 millimeter, which I prefer, you get eight. Higher capacity, something I can shoot really well, a way that I can carry it and it's really comfortable and it's out of the way. Let's check that one. I don't even know if I hit it. I was able to get three shots off on that first one uh, with the VersaCarry deployment and I hit it once, not even close to the center at probably 15 yards. One of the biggest things you need to think about when you are packing a gun in the backcountry and you're in bear territory is, is that gun accessible? How fast can you access it? Most of the time when it comes to legit bear charges, it happens so quick. And so if you have something in your backpack, I mean, it's as good as not bringing it with you because you're not gonna be able to get to it in most cases. This is a gun that I do like to carry. I don't shoot it quite as well, but it's the Springfield XDS and it's a 45 auto, good concealed gun. I have the extended mag in there. This is a capacity of seven. Uh, so you don't get that much uh, more capacity than say a 44, but what I like about it is how light it is and how compact it is. The function with the Everly Stock Bino Harness, they make it specifically to carry, you know, a pistol like this or smaller. I usually just go on the safe side and I don't pack my pistol with one in the chamber. Mm -hmm. And so that there's a con to that too, because that's just one more step that you have to do if you have to react in the heat of the moment. Well, three shots, but it's kind of a point and a shoot type deal. You're trying to aim as best you can and still get some rounds down range, I guess. Well, I hit it once up on the top again, about the same spot on the, the previous round. So one out of three, pretty low odds. If you're trying to pull the trigger you, and you only have three seconds to take down an attacker or take down that grizzly bear, that's pretty fast. And sometimes it's less than three seconds, obviously, in your situation. The last and final pistol that we're gonna look at is, I don't know, whatever you wanna call it, is a little suicide pistol, where if you're gonna use this effectively, it's gonna be at close range, that bear is gnawing on you, and you shoot it in the head up close, because plain and simple, accuracy out past 10 yards is gonna be difficult. Yeah, so, and I would say that. Yeah, and this is a hammer. Especially in a fight or flight situation, yeah, sure. it's you're gonna have trouble staying on target. Right. And you need one shot to do as much damage as possible because you may not be able to do two or three shots behind that. Right, right. And this is a Smith uh, M&P and it's a, a five round capacity 357 Magnum. It is a, an ultra lightweight option, but you have five shots and I can't shoot these as well. Maybe if, if you really shoot yours a lot and you're really accurate with them. Wow. Personally, I leave these at home. <laughs> Incredibly hard to get back on target. Like it actually kind of hurt. I got th three out of the five off, not bad, but I don't know how accurate I was. Even at 10 yards, I didn't hit anything. So for something like that, I would be only comfortable. It's kind of your last desperate shot when he's chewing on you, putting it in his face. Another option in the backcountry, I don't recommend packing this in on your back. You have the weight to deal with, but if you're horse hunting or you're getting horse dropped like I do quite a bit, we do bring this. And this is a 12 gauge, this is a Mossberg happens to be, and we'll bring double op buckshot and slugs and maybe we'll alternate slug buckshot in the tube and use that for protection. Uh, if you notice all the game wardens, all the fish wildlife guys for bear protection, this is what they use. They use a slug gun and it is effective. 
Miss some, hit some. I see a lot of holes in it. That's what you can expect though. You're shooting from the hip and you can't really aim this thing. So it's a close combat weapon. We shot the whole tube, boys. <laughs> so let's talk about ammo real quick. I think more importantly is how many rounds can you get on target? So many people get so wound up in having the perfect bullet shooting out of their you know, self-defense gun for bear. And at the end of the day, they can't even accurately shoot that gun. So what does it matter? Yes, and I would rather have a pistol that I can manage easier, shoot better, it may not have as much power as the 44, but if I can put a 185 grain 10 millimeter where I want it to be, 10 millimeter is plenty powerful too. Yeah. I would say my favorite gun to carry in the backcountry is a double action, single action, such as this um, SP2022 that is in 357 SIG. Guys have theories on, on what to carry as far as bullet choice goes for bears. The last couple of years, I've been carrying uh, FMJs, a full metal jacket, and then a hollow point, and I alternate in my magazine. The idea behind that is the FMJ is going to be a penetrator. It's not going to expand. It's going to penetrate, break bone, and intended to drive deep and pass through. On the other end of the spectrum, you have a standard hollow point. It's meant to mushroom. It's, it's meant to transfer that shock and that energy into the animal. The third option we have are the V-Crown. Ben, he carries V-Crown, and tell us a little bit about those. The V-Crown ammo is meant to have good expansion, reliable penetration. If I'm shooting at, especially a grizzly bear, I would like to have them bullets stop in that animal to um, you know, expend all their energy in that animal. I don't know which is better. Maybe on some of the big grizzly bears, you wanna penetrate their forehead, guys would, tend to go with an FMJ. Do you really need that? I don't know. I, I don't think you can go wrong, but. No. Goes back to making sure that you hit the animal. That is first and foremost, I mean, no matter what bullet you have, if you miss it three times, it's already on top of you. Yeah. So. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I better make it that far, that's close. We have some expired bear spray and we're gonna test these. We are 30 feet away from a nice clean slate. They're effective to 30 feet. We're gonna test that number one. And number two, we're gonna test, are these still good? Everybody has expired bear spray, I feel like. The reason why bear spray expires is that there's a seal in here that holds in the propellant. Now, over the years when these are going from hot to cold they're sitting in your car that seal can dry out and that propellant can slowly leak out the big thing for me when it comes to bear spray is you really have to pay attention to the wind obviously if you're having to spray this in the field at a bear you're not going to be thinking of this for science i'm going to be a guinea pig and see if any of this residual stuff affects me when i test these bottles let's try a 2008 bottle this has been expired for 12 years. What is it, 2020? Yeah, 12 years. Got a wind kind of right to left from our back. Let's see what happens. Whew. Let that air out for a second. I did kind of angle a little bit, but once again, the wind really plays a big effect. So this whole 30 foot business it's got to be dead calm for that to work, to, to really be able to hit a target at distance. In reality, I see this working within 20 feet, maybe even closer. So I did kind of angle it as I was adjusting for the wind, but there's a million little specks. The mega can canister of counter assault. This is new formula, it's supposed to go a little farther, last longer. It's the best of both worlds. So here's, the bungee case. This is like my pride and joy one. Okay, a big canister. Whew. 
Whew. So we had seven, eight seconds there. Looked like the same type of propellant. And this one expired in 2023, so. But man, double capacity probably. Two for one and one can right there. You keep your bear spray in a controlled, a more controlled environment. You don't leave it in your car. You don't let it get super hot, super cold, back and forth. I think it's gonna last a long time. So maybe I would trust my life more on expired bear spray. The other takeaway to me was the up to 30 foot is probably in perfect conditions. No wind, maybe shooting downhill, but in reality, it's 15 feet and the wind affects it greatly. Between the pistol shooting and the bear spray de deployment, be prepared, get comfortable with your pistol of choice, get comfortable with bear spray. If you have your old bear spray can, go test it. Go spray it so you know what it's like and you'll be more prepared for a bad encounter in the woods. That's all you can do.